And today, today is my very great pleasure to invite a guest from US Madagascar to present here today, Dr. James Herrera. Dr. James Herrera is uh, with Duke University in the US and often say based in Madagascar with the Duke Limur Center. James today separates, I think, his work between research but also kind of applied conservation science. And as you have already noticed, we are looking also very much at the trees and James also studies trees, but different approach. I mean, we are, also, for example, last week, it was more about natural science and civic culture and something. This is more a biocultural approach and the biocultural approach is enriched by his specific knowledge also on the lemurs. The lemurs are primates occurring only in Madagascar today and some islands around. And James is actually a lemur specialist. He received his PhD in year 2015 from New York and um, actually focusing on the biogeography, the phylog phylogeny and so on of lemur species. And uh, James didn't come alone. He brought along his partner, Mary. Very warm welcome also to Mary. She also follows the biocultural approach. And today, I just want to hand over and give the floor to you. Thank you for coming, both of you, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, Dirk, for the invitation. And thank you for all to be here. It's a really amazing opportunity. It's been a long-term goal of mine to come to Germany and especially Göttingen. And it's been a really enriching experience to be able to discuss uh, research and collaborative projects with the many of you. Um, so today I will be talking about the biocultural approach, which is how we uh, look at our research and conservation, which it means that we recognize and appreciate the intimate and inextricable links between the biological phenomena and the social, cultural, economic processes that shape the landscape. And we also seek to increase the diversity and resilience of those systems as a part of this. But I want to take you directly to the northeast of Madagascar, an area known as the Sava. It's approximately 25,000 square kilometers, a little bit smaller than Belgium, and over a million people. And it is home to diverse species of plants and animals found nowhere else in the world. Um, the diversity is really unparalleled, but also coupled with this human cultural diversity. And, you know, in Madagascar, there's over 300 species of birds and similar number of mammals, over 800 species of reptiles and amphibians, by some counts, 14,000 species of plants, uh, and they're almost all endemic, only found in Madagascar. It's been an isolated island for at least 90 million years, and the species that we see there today, many of them arrived via dispersal and they represent adaptive radiations that have filled numerous ecological niches. Uh, there's also numerous medicinal plants that we're discovering and other beneficial organisms that we're just learning about. But just in the last thousand years or so, that landscape has transformed. We see an increase in the uh, sediment record of charcoal and a transition from tree seeds and pollen to grasses. We also see the disappearance of at least 17 species of giant lemurs, the largest bird that ever lived, the elephant bird. And we know that humans played a role in this transformation, but we really don't know what the effects have been on ecosystem function. We also know we're just scratching the surface of, of species diversity. Every year we discover new species. And just as one example, the invertebrates are very poorly known. There's over a thousand species of ants. Imagine what that means for all these other poorly studied organisms. So plenty of space for people to continue to make amazing discoveries in this country. But again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue where it's not only about the biodiversity, but about the people. 
Uh, there's 25 million people in Madagascar or more. 80% are rural farmers, and they practice traditional Sweden or shifting agriculture like the billions of people in the tropics. Uh, that involves cutting and burning the vegetation before planting annual crops like rice. And in the past, this may have been sustainable, and in certain cases it may still be. But we see that this level of pressure on the forest has led to a rapid decline in forest cover. Just since 1950, when we have aerial imagery, moving forward to when we have satellites, we can see that, especially in the last 30 years, there has been a significant loss of forest cover. Even just in the last 20 years, in the Sava region specifically, 26% of the forest cover has been lost. And that results in carbon emissions, but that's just a drop in the bucket compared to all the other sources of carbon emissions. The real loss is in the carbon sequestration and ecosystem services that those forests provide. Uh, one of the main factors driving forest loss is fire. Uh, and these are small-scale fires by smallholder farmers. Um, but, you know, if we just look at the last year, there were over 300 of them in this region alone. Thankfully, the last year was a little bit lower than what we saw during the COVID pandemic years when fires really spiked. But uh, we know that this continues to put pressure on the um, uh, remaining forest cover. And, you know, it's, it's an active area of research to understand at what le level this might be sustainable or not. But I don't want to focus too much on that because really the people depend on these forest resources for food, for, uh, you know, there's numerous different uh, uh, agricultural products. Uh, all their construction materials for these communities that live on the forest frontier, they come from the forest. People who use it for subsistence, building their own home, or they make their living by selling and, and producing furniture and, and, and building homes. Um, we also know that it's an important source of medicine. Uh, the trees and herbs provide all sorts of medicinal properties that people rely on. Fuel, the, most people rely on firewood and charcoal to cook and heat their homes. And the charcoal is really being produced at an exponential rate to, uh, to, to provide for the burgeoning uh, urban populations. But at the same time, we know that Madagascar has a wealth of valuable cash crops, like coffee, uh, vanilla, the world's best coffee and most of the world's co uh, vanilla comes from Madagascar. There's also cloves, uh, which are very popular abroad, but also used medicinally in Madagascar. There's pepper, there's pineapples, there's uh, sugarcane, and numerous other, uh, especially cacao, numerous other crops that are uh, produced in Madagascar, sold abroad, and they also provide economic income for people. So for decades, research has been showing that community governance of these forests can have positive impacts for both people and nature, that agroforestry can be a solution to many of the global health challenges we face, and that smallholder farmers, more than two billion people around the world, are providing food for uh, the rest of the, of, the, of the globe. And so we often think about how there was once these pristine forests that have now been transformed to cropland, pastureland, urban spaces, uh, but it's within the grasp of these smallholder farmers to convert those landscapes into productive uh, agri agri agroforestry systems as well. Now, when I say we take a biocultural approach, what I mean is we need to recognize that there are different knowledge systems. There are ex situ actors, international organizations who make global policies, uh, globalization of commodities, and then there are in situ actors, people who are based in the places of interest, and they have a depth of indigenous knowledge that is seldom uh, synthesized with these ex situ actors. But if we can bring these different ways of knowing together, we can really make uh, informed policies that are more equitable, as well as productive and sustainable. And so that's what we're seeking to do in our microcosm in the Sava region. We're really trying to engage the local actors, learn from this uh, traditional ecological knowledge, and implement it in this complex landscape. Uh, when I say complex, I mean truly it is an agro-ecosystem matrix where it's sometimes it's difficult to tell where does a forest end and a cropland begin. And so within that framework, we can really start to think about sustainability. So I'm going to bring us to one of our case studies, uh, the sacred mountain of Ambantaza. 
This is a mountain site where the local communities came to the DLC and requested uh, technical assistance in a restoration project that I'm going to let them tell you a little bit more about the history of this site. So this complex history of natural processes like cyclones followed by anthropogenic fires are coupled with an even deeper history that's been revealed through focus groups where there were international logging concessions. Uh, but the community needs this forest, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about where they want to go next. Tenga fara chavan le taniti maru maru tonta tuje ke ni tanju zeni a ni ni si wela metu ba isi ni rano amne ambani ani ali zava barit zeni bibi shankaraz zeni a ni niyaz. This is a really challenging site to work in because of this uh, biophysical and deep history. I mean, there's barely any soil left. It's just leaf litter on top of a rocky basalt substrate. So that comes with lots of challenges to restoration. We'll return to Ambantaza later, but next I want to visit another case study, uh, Amburnala where there's a somewhat unlikely group of actors, the local military, who want to participate in restoration. So Madagascar has, uh, is participating in the bond challenge and they're committing to reforesting, uh, I think it's 4 million hectares of land by 2030. And the government really mandates that all actors get involved in these restoration projects, including the military. Now for decades, the military has been working closely with the rural community that neighbors their land to create a restoration and reforestation project where local communities can put in requests to uh, extract timber from this uh, reforestation effort, which they use for community projects like rebuilding the school. Uh, and so they've been facing a lot of challenges, especially technically and with fire damage that, you know, also these soils are just super, super low quality. So it's been very, very difficult for them to achieve their goals. And that's where they came to the DLC uh, requesting assistance. And we're working together, not only for uh, creating timber forests, but also fruit tree orchards that 
in the future, they've told us they want the children to be able to realize the value of this land for more than just cutting trees. They want them to be able to harvest fruits from these forests. So until now, I've talked about some of the restoration projects and, and one approach we take, which is on communal lands. The communities have dedicated portions of land that they specifically want to set aside for restoration. Next, I want to talk about how we work with individual smallholder farmers who have chosen that they want to use agroforestry, for example, to uh, diversify their income and to bring back ecosystem services that have been lost. And, uh, you know, it's really challenging. This is a really uh, remote landscape. We go by foot, we go by boat, uh, we go on some really bad roads. But it really gives you a, an appreciation for the diversity of these landscapes. We also try to couple all these programs with environmental education opportunities, working with schools to set up tree nurseries where the children are involved in caring for the nurseries. And uh, we're going to visit one of those examples here in the Andapa district. Um, it's a really diverse landscape uh, and you know these uh, various agroforestry uh, practices have, have, have been put into place for many, many years with mixed results. And so in this particular case uh, in Andapa, they'll tell you a little bit more about their goals. Ari Nangano plan de demonstration tato. Ze yenti Ampafantarani Raymandin Sintiana Tamni Pum Fumbliana Kakazba Iterizing a Sengari Bafandariu Hamuk Tale Zanakazu, a family year to Tulian Zentangale Tambulu and Zeni Efasmari Ripadip Kanyala Fata Tauriana Refanis Zizen at Ni Tilton Tauriana. If a smart moody night net in Yala, Ari Mavin Bull, Armarisk in the Wakan Puni, Angatin Fartetu, Refatum Gavantis after Tigan. Zezele Tubin be amnesty. As I said, environmental education is a fundamental aspect of our projects, and we're going to visit another actor who is a partner in many of the diversity turn research projects as well. Uh, who has dedicated his land to making an interpretive center? I am in 2018. I am in the city of Tanzania. 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 I am in the city of Ari ni tangu zengi ba hapa fanta cha ni fataran zanui tuere na mis azengi ari ande ya anga biashara ni vizaza zengi zavuta ni tangu mni demi dzuit fata tiba fara dia ni sini fera miasa zeta mni ili uchara sita pu na manga avengi dilambata avengi analmo piana tava mni university ana mari anga rani na kre dia viviana anga rani na kre so we take a community-based approach to all our efforts, and we use applied research to guide our methodology. Um, we start with uh, household interviews, focus groups, and a lot of community meetings to understand what are the challenges that farmers are facing and what are the solutions that they envision. We're also really interested in uh, human health, especially maternal and infant health. I'm working with uh, PhD candidate Nestorine. She's studying uh, different aspects of nutritional health uh, and also uh, teaching about uh, nutritious diets and diversifying diets to improve their health and how that is coupled to how they use the landscape. Um, but we really strive to co-create these action plans with the communities. Uh, they are telling us what their goals are, what their needs are, and we can formulate these, uh, these written agreements together. Before we put a single tree in the ground, we spent a year just creating these conventions and, and written agreements on what are the shared goals, the responsibilities, and especially figuring out uh, land rights and land claims, because we need to know that these lands are protected in the long term. 
Once all that is in place, we create tree nurseries, and the goal is that by having these locally based tree nurseries, uh, the trees are well adapted to the place they're going to be planted. We're using some technical uh, uh, aspects of uh, improving seed germination with these seed beds that I'll tell you more about in a moment. Um, and uh, also, you know, have to spend a lot of time acquiring local soils so that the seedlings will be adapted to those local conditions, mixing with sand and some compost to give those seedlings a fighting chance. We do a lot of surveys with the communities to determine what trees they want uh, and, and tailoring each individual project based on local needs. And so in these little sandboxes, the seeds are germinated so they can easily be transplanted into those pots. It really speeds up the process. Within just five or eight months, these seedlings are ready to go out and be planted in the landscape. But we're also experimenting with a few different methods, like direct seeding, for example, uh, either with the seed itself or what we call seed balls. seed ball, bomb in French. Karazana system zany afanga mangano fambolena kakazo amizay toko hoe semi direct zany le voana kakazo zany fongosiny amizay melange na tena ombi miaraka fasikimenty ndraiky jofo avake rano ampesaina aminazy ka itima zany tekniky henga na indrindra zany izy raha ohatra ka hanandre fambolena kakazo zany ka vita mazaina izy apetraka agnatiny 2 jours na 3 jours zany this method is especially useful for trees with tap roots so that the, tr the roots don't get root bound in those small pots, uh, which would stymie their growth. But once these tree seedlings are, are uh, big enough and ready to be planted, we work very closely with the local community members. They choose the areas that they wish to restore. And, you know, it takes a lot of work. This is all done by hand. There are no heavy machinery. Uh, you know, a lot of these areas are completely overtaken by invasive grasses and bracken ferns and vines that we've got to clear back from these planting areas and maintain consistently throughout the year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really an amazing uh, endeavor when we've got, you know, over a hundred people coming out to participate. Even just taking out those plastic pots is a step that's sometimes forgotten in these larger scale tree planting and what to do with all that plastic waste. We've got to take it off of these restoration areas and dispose of them properly. So that's really, really uh, fundamental, just teaching best practices, getting the communities engaged, and, um, and it really turns out to be a lot of fun, even though it is hard work. When it comes to our collaboration with the local military, they've got officers, they've got the cadets, and the local communities with whom they collaborate all coming out multiple times a year to do both the tree planting and the maintenance. And, you know, even the high-level officers, like this general, come out to oversee the project because this has been their goal for a long time. Maintenance is critical, so these trees, you know, they need little shade structures uh, because this hot sun, you know, there's almost no shade in most of the places we're planting them. So we create these shade structures which must be maintained until the trees are big enough and strong enough to withstand that sun. And when we're talking about the uh, integrated landscape management with the individual farmers, again, tailoring it to what the farmers desire, whether it's uh, coconuts and cloves or vanilla, like in this clip, teaching about best practices, uh, you know, for example, planting on contour, using swales and berms to capture rainwater, amending these really low quality soils with compostable material. We've got to bring these, the organic matter back to these soils to give these seedlings a fighting chance. After planting, we cover it with a nice thick level layer of mulch. All this is necessary to preserve and increase the soil quality, create shade structures. And it's not only about trees, but it can be an integrated agroforestry system. We're also experimenting with syntropic farming, if anybody's been uh, studying about that, how to integrate and think about succession in this agroforestry uh, landscape. I am the eight months because I'm too tired to eat. I'm too tired to to eat. I'm too tired 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 to eat. I'm 
ka ratam talo zin tizo maniv ki zavatra tini zavatra zvantinge fir pam zoftu na afka mambul razing zey manu manga tsara zey fumba fumbling uotam zey manga vol rakt zin vol rakt zey zavatra abuza ka zey narakofanen vuli ba ampa mandun tan. Eu ia no cua, tam volun zé zé na mboli, carazé na mukuna, barra anda com fumantani, para mandantani, rei favteu, na mboli saramasu, amzoftuna zé zé na mboli casca, funci, lodi zé a volne me aracato, faz zé zé sam tam futuna na, na lefa malo tam volun, carazé na reki, de afka irnando, na pangaram kon mangaraka, de amzo zé zé tefa, não me consigo zé 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 Arantan ko fa ita fa may may acara uotam zeng itan si ka zo zeng nrakof nga buzga meki efa ir na da may ir zo may si so ranga da kani fa zeng itan si ka zo fa bola mandu ar miskan ka nab zeng isi ar iramam tan dek zeng si ka am niretu tan si seraktu ita zo may nga mafting nga mafiz ita fa cinto miting le le tan Kami jauh zengi ini tadi jauh cara, fena mandunga, zen rakofunga buzak, fantan cis raktu izmeng bezod. Kau zengi azat jauh zeng mamboli, na hamfutan mentani, ba az amukt, na desi sorangan arit kau zeng cima defa hafu na manduru tanit zeng, fa mampias sistem ni agroekologi zeng zeng. Speaking of fire, we have to protect these landscapes from the neighboring uh, communities which still use traditional practices, including fire. And so we spend a lot of time and effort creating fire breaks and also working with the local community members to talk and be more communicative and, and align those efforts, you know, telling each other when we're planning on burning, leading workshops on best practices of how to use fire and, and manage the fire sustainably. Uh, and again, all done by hand. There's no heavy machinery, and they do an amazing job. I mean, you can even see these fire breaks from space in this Google Earth image. I also want to point out in the top right portion of the screen, if you can see it, this is a growing oil palm plantation. I know that's a big part of the research done with the CRC, in case there's any interest in pursuing it here. So now just to look at some of the outcomes we've seen thus far. Um, we're using satellite imagery to measure how landscape and, and land cover types are changing through time due to fire. So we see that in the early 2010s, there was mostly burning of grasslands and savannas. But as we moved into the you know, 2019 era, we see a, a much larger increase in forest fires. There was a really big stress due to the COVID pandemic that uh, really led people to turn more towards forest products and, and clearing forests for agriculture. In the past, especially the early 2000s, we see more of a biennial trend in burning where, you know, they burn one year and, and not in the second. And then since 2009, 2010, we see a much more consistent uh, burning every year. Uh, you know, of course, it's not causality, but there was also a political coup d'etat at that time period where there was a, a lot less oversight over uh, forest resources. So these are really affecting the land cover type. Based on our household surveys, we see that the majority of farmers are smallholder farmers, and there's simply, there's huge yield gaps. So in terms of their rice productivity, they should be producing two tons of rice per hectare, not less than 400 kilos. They should be producing as much as 600 kilos of vanilla per hectare, not 30 kilos. And they really don't, they're not able to keep very many domestic animals. In terms of the nutritional health research, we see that 11% of mothers and infants are anemic. This is lower than many other regions of Madagascar where we see upwards of 20, 25%. So we're encouraged by that, but it still has a negative impact on long-term health outcomes. 42% of children are stunted, 22% of children are wasted. Again, this has long-term implications for the sustainability of the communities as well as the landscape. And why do we see this? We see that, you know, when we do 24-hour recalls about diet, that the dietary diversity is very low. 
using this uh, scale from the FAO, you know, most people are getting less than five different food groups per day, which is considered inadequate to meet their mic micronutrient needs. We also use another kind of standardized, though adapted, uh, instrument from the FAO called the Food Insecurity Experience Score, uh, where you know five, a score of five or above is considered moderate to severe food insecurity. They have to go whole days without eating. And we see the vast majority of people fall into this high-risk uh, category. So these are some of the causes that people tell us. This is why we turn to forest resources. We don't, we, we, we're not making our ends meet. But they also tell us about how important those forest resources are for their daily lives. Not just for timber that they sell like we might immediately think, but the second most common use for these trees is medicine. This is their pharmacy in the forest. And in places like Madagascar where the healthcare infrastructure is not the best, uh, taking away their access to those forests is really detrimental to their health. When we ask the participants what they perceive to be the major causes of forest loss, they've told us about these cycles of the cyclones and fires which have really had these big impacts but also the charcoal production, land clearance for agriculture, population growth. They also tell us that yes, we understand harvesting trees is uh, you know, causing forest loss, but a lot of that harvesting is from outsiders, not people in the community. People coming from faraway cities, logging in their forest just to go back and, and sell those products. So it's not even the local communities that benefit from that tree extraction. When we ask people about the benefits they derive from the forest, they immediately respond happily saying, we recognize the ecosystem services that these forests provide. The, for the forests seed the rain. Uh, they re recognize that in areas where the forest is gone, there's, there's very little rainfall. Uh, the clean air that they uh, enjoy, the clean water like we saw at Ambantaza, that these watersheds are the sources that people depend on for cooking water, uh, um, for cleaning, for irrigating their fields. Again, medicinal plants are high on their list of the benefits they derive from forest. And without these uh, medicines that they get from the forest, they would really be at a loss. So we have to really, oh, and I can't forget about the spiritual uses. People have a spiritual connection to these forests. They go to the forest for rituals. They bury their dead in the forest. So when we ask what do they think we should do to protect and restore the land, they tell us we need to restrict and manage our tree harvesting in a more sustainable manner. They also really want to plant trees to bring these forests back. Um, they recognize the importance of fire prevention, fire management, and that they, they, they know that in the past the methods they used may not be effective in the future. Um, they also want to be able to maintain their land and fallow, but as the population is growing, there's less and less land for people to shift to so they tend to, uh, where it used to be a 10 or 15 year rotation, it's now two or three years. So while they understand that they need to have this fallow period, they also need to eat. So this is where we really had to step back and think carefully about how we would go forward uh, in, in protecting these forests. Uh, it really has to be a people and nature approach. Um, just talking about the reforestation efforts, we've planted more than 50 species of trees, uh, but it's mostly been concentrated in its top five uh, species, which have been, uh, you know, we've seen the, the highest uh, survival rates and the highest uh, success rates. We've planted over 100,000 trees in the last three years uh, on about 150 hectares. And, you know, this does kind of pale in comparison to some of the big projects where we hear about planting millions of trees. And, you know, we, we still think about that, but I just can't imagine with the level of maintenance and evaluation and uh, collaborative uh, conventions with the communities, how could you possibly reforest 4 million hectares? Um, but, you know, with the right financial backing, it, it may really be possible. The uh, level of planting has varied over the years. Um, first, you know, just in accordance with what, what we were capable of, you know, how, much, how many seedlings the nurseries were producing, um, how much motivation the communities had, and we could really see that it increased in many of these sites over time. People really got engaged and wanted to continue planting. But it is challenging, you know, producing the seedlings alone is, is a really challenging uh, aspect of this project. And, you know, when we look at survival after one year, we do see significant variation across sites. 
So for example, in two sites, there was significantly lower survival than in a third site, Nanjapengi, all compared to the Ambantaza site, where we see about 50-50. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of underlying variables that I can't get into in this talk that may be predicting that survival and, and the mortality. Um, the underlying soil quality, which we are measuring, uh, but we're just scratching the surface of those analyses. And so uh, also just existing forest around that can provide some shade and provide uh, the leaf litter, which can start to bring the soil uh, organic matter back. When we're looking over three years, we've been a little bit discouraged. Uh, after the first year, we see about 50% mortality. In the second year, only about 25% of the seedlings are surviving. But still, we're really proud of that 25% because it's such a difficult landscape to work in and these seedlings are really you know they're doing the best they can on their own this is all rain fed systems and those few that are surviving we're really really excited to see uh, just how well they're doing um, just as a as a brief example we can show you from one of the sites you know some of these trees are, are, are really showing impressive growth um, you know some of them as much as two meters tall already in such a short time i never thought that would be possible Mission Zeng ni asa vita. Mission Zema Zeng ni fambule na kakazu. Tamton na 2021. Nisko ma Zeng tamton 2022. Ar nisko Zeng tamton na ti. Kaiet ma Zeng angan presentation kiel Zeng am ni vukata sane tam ni 2021. Mar mar ma Zeng le kakazu. Zeng namboli. Kai Mission Zeng ma Zeng ni hinti ni. Is ma Zeng tanti ka mangulonga. Iti urunan sarti, isikah jere benci kat sini awe faham atau kui mahaju dua meter angkang, na em meter kat perven di sekang ni ala basa ngan asli. Returning to the individual smallholder farmers with whom we're collaborating, we asked what kind of training in agriculture, especially, are you most interested in. And the overwhelming response was agroforestry, especially with cash crops like cloves, cacao, and vanilla falls in that same category because vanilla must be grown uh, within this kind of forest setting with uh, what we call support or tutor trees uh, that can provide a little bit of shade for them. And you know, also market vegetable farming where as we talked about in the one case, we can actually do both in the same space for the first few years until those trees start to grow in and create a more closed canopy as some of the research is, uh, is, is moving forward uh, here in, in your institution as well. So with that in mind, we were really encouraged to see that so many people were uh, motivated to plant trees on their landscape. And that's that also speaks to the survival. Actually, we've trained, uh, had more than 250 farmers engaged in these training workshops. Uh, we're able to follow up with about half of them, and 65% are using the techniques they used, uh, learned in the workshops. And they're seeing 80 or 90% survival because those are their trees. They're proud of them. They are taking care of them. They say, these, kids, these trees are for our children because we want our children to have these resources in the future. So to kind of summarize the approach we take in a, this biocultural landscape restoration project, uh, it starts with identifying the key stakeholders, the motivated individuals who desire to have these uh, projects on their landscapes. Without them, none of this would be possible. With them, we decide what are the, the targets and the desired outcomes that we share and what are the uh, needs that they have. How can we uh, create these these written uh, agreements that clearly outline roles and responsibilities and, and shared uh, interests. And once we had those in place, we were able to create these tree nurseries, uh, or in many cases, there were other projects like the Swiss organization, Gren de Vie, which has provided a lot of uh, tree seedlings that we've been able to incorporate into this uh, project as well. Uh, it took a lot of research to understand what is the best plant, uh, planting spacing, you know, how far apart should we be planting these trees? Do we need certain trees that can tolerate the sun, like pioneer species, and if so, which ones are most suited to these environments? Uh, and so by co-creating this kind of evidence-based planting strategy, we were really able to, um, to, to, to come up with something that we thought would be more effective than you know, just kind of a mass planting of as many trees as possible. 
The maintenance is critical. I mean, we go out twice a year just to cut back all those invasive grasses and weeds which are otherwise smothering those tree seedlings. And it's going to take time before the trees can outcompete all those weeds. Evaluation is critical. We really need to know, is this working before we continue to dump funds and time and resources into these projects? And then as we do these evaluations, we start to understand what are the challenges that we're facing and what are these novel solutions that we can come up with together? For example, creating these shade structures. It's, it's extremely intensive, but really necessary to ensure a higher survival probability. So on the one hand, we take these results and we disseminate them to the local communities to get their feedback, as well as create, creating white papers that we can share uh, more broadly and share with our, our um, supporters. But this is an iterative process. We can, are constantly going back to those written agreements and reformulating to make sure that we are hitting our targets. And if we're not, maybe those targets need to be adjusted because they were unrealistic. So in some cases, we're actually trying to move that target higher. You know, we started out with 10 or 20,000 seedlings as our goal this year. We we're really trying for 100,000. So um, we're really excited as this continues to develop. Um, and like I said, it's, it's iterative. So we're, we're constantly creating these living documents and, and uh, protocols of our collaboration, how we are going to implement these projects, you know, for real on the ground. And uh, it's, it's definitely uh, taxing, but it's worth it because there are many co-benefits. The communities and the solidarity that is created uh, by these big projects where people come together to, to restore their land, they, you know, a lot of these villages are, are extremely remote and they're separated by a day's journey. And people come in droves to, to, to participate in the meetings as well as the tree planting. Um, and there's also, you know, many uh, outcomes uh, aside from, you know, just tree planting. So, for example, um, in the case of Ambantaza, they asked us to be a third-party intermediary that could oversee the democratic election of local leaders who would oversee this transfer of management from the government to the local stakeholders. So that was just one area in which we were able to help out beyond just planting trees. We also assist in the creation of microcredit and microfinance projects that are based in the village because banking systems are simply inaccessible for most of the people in the countryside. And having this entrepreneurship and this system of savings gives them uh, a lot more opportunities. We do a lot of training in uh, market vegetable gardening and farming because that was one of the main things that people said. This is something that can produce uh, an income in just two or three months. We can harvest these crops and have a little bit to eat and have a little bit to sell. And so we're training in best practices of agroecology. Again, you know, it comes down to basics of organic matter and compost, amending these soils so that they can be productive. Over 500 farmers have participated in these workshops. And you know, we're, we've been able to follow up with about half of those farmers. And 50% of them immediately adopt these new techniques. And 95% of those early adopters report improved yield, better results, and uh, improvements in their dietary diversity as well. I mean, all these crops, you know, they're, they're, they're available, but they just weren't productive before. And so now um, that they are producing more, we can go to the next step, which is teaching about cooking and nutritious diets. So again, Nestorine is not only collecting data about nutritional health, but paying it forward and, and teaching about diversifying diets, which she calls Sakafu Maruluku, the food of many colors. And so uh, she teaches about making a nutrient-dense porridge for infants. Uh, and it's not just for the infants. It turns out it's delicious, and the adults love it too. <laughs> but uh, everybody gets involved. They're helping in a participatory way to, to do these cooking workshops. And then, you know, it, it really is challenging. Remember, we're out there in the countryside cooking on an open flame and uh, trying to, you know, serve over 100 people. It requires a lot of rice. But it's really, really fulfilling to be able to participate in these kinds of workshops where the communities are engaged, but we also all get to enjoy a delicious and nutritious meal together in the end. Um, as we continue to, to, to learn about the challenges that people face in their staple agriculture, like rice farming, we're finding uh, the appropriate uh, trainers who can bring new methods. So for example, 
Um, maybe some of you have heard of the system of rice intensification. Uh, we've had over 100 farmers in seven different communities trained in this uh, method, which uh, cuts down on the amount of seed stock that the farmers need. So that immediately saves in their household budget. But also, it can be more productive. So with the proper plant spacing and the timing of planting, uh, we can actually, we've, we've observed yield increases of more than one and a half times. And this is still in the kind of the pilot phase. It's really hard to, to break tradition, but when they see these uh, amazing results, they're really convinced. Aquaculture is another really great system that we use to, to teach about different alternatives. Uh, using an incentive-based program, the uh, lead farmers who have adopted these new techniques can also apply to, to earn uh, watering cans and other uh, in, uh, uh, important farming equipment. Environmental education is fundamental to all the efforts we have, uh, starting with the schools and building up to huge community-wide celebrations like World Lemur Day and the International Day of the Environment. We just had almost 1,200 people turn out, including local authorities from the government, from the Madagascar National Parks. And this is an opportunity for the people to, to tell the authorities, we want this restoration. We need improved policy. So thinking about these outcomes, starting just from these seedlings that you know, are only recently put in the ground to these bigger picture concepts of agroecosystems and agroforestry, not, not, not a lot of this is new. People have been practicing this for decades, but especially with a lot of the global demand for high value crops like vanilla, there have been trans transitions to more monoculture. We're trying to bring back traditions of diversified home gardens that include bananas, cacao, uh, breadfruit, uh, and you can, you can grow them all together. You know, the vanilla can be grown right there in the same plot with the cacao so that they have this uh, insurance. If one crop doesn't produce, they've got others that can take over. In the long term, our dream is that the forest will be restored, the animals will come back, and they will continue this process in perpetuity. Because it's the animals, like the lemurs, that are the crucial seed dispersers who are doing the real tree planting. They're eating the fruits from these trees, and they're spreading the seeds and their feces, and that's how natural recruitment happens. That's the long-term goal. But I just, you know, also want to uh, think beyond the forest and back to the communities. So it's really, really important to us that the communities are not only participating, but they're giving us their feedback. So I wanted to share that, you know, the people that you just saw in this video, they gave us feedback on earlier drafts. They see how this is being uh, portrayed and they, they help to, to co-create the final products in every way. I'm very grateful for the team of colleagues and collaborators that I've had the great fortune to work with from Madagascar, from the U.S., and uh, many other countries as well. None of this work would be possible without them. I thank Ricardo, who's the amazing videographer who produced all the wonderful imagery we got to see today. And I thank my sponsors and the sponsors for this project. Um, and I also thank you again for the invitation to come and to share this work with you. James, thank you so much. That was an inspiring talk. Very, very interesting. I'm deeply impressed by the work you realize in the field, but also in the communication with us. And I hope for a very good discussion. And now I'm looking to the audience who would like to have the first question. Well, thank you, first of all, for your really amazing presentation and talk. It was really fun and interesting. Um, my question is, uh, you do a lot of amazing work there, and uh, I guess often the problem is the capacity and the funding that you have. So my question is, uh, how big is your capacity to take on new communities that might be interested in this? And is there a limit in the next years, or what's the major problem in that uh, direction? Thank you for that question. Yes, we are a small organization, you know, we're not the WWF or WCS. Um, we are, um, actually we have a staff of 
five <laughs> permanent employees. So uh, we currently have 12 communities with whom we collaborate very closely. Only a few of them were shown in, in this video. And I often say to myself, we are at max capacity with those 12 communities. But when new communities come to us with their impressive ideas and their motivation, I have a hard time saying no. Um, and so we just really strive to continue to grow the, pro the project. It's really only possible with our collaborations with local stakeholders, especially uh, the team at the regional university, which is in uh, the region, it's called CURSA, uh, with whom uh, the members of the CRC here have also collaborated. They really are the rock stars who have done the hard work. They're out there all the time participating in the tree planting, leading these meetings, collecting the data, um, and, and feeding the information back to the communities. So uh, as our project grows, we've taken on a lot more, uh, you know, people who started out as assistants and now are leaders. And we really want to see that model continue because, you know, even if I am no longer with the project, they can keep it going. But it does come down to funding. And so we're, um, like, you know, many academics, we're constantly looking for new grants. I actually have one due on Sunday night. <laughs> so hopefully I'll still get that done. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm keen to collaborate as well. If this uh, presentation spoke to anyone, you know, we're, we're really open to taking on new research projects. Because even with, um, you know, focused research, we can learn a lot more, we can develop more capacity with the local stakeholders, bring on more researchers. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, thank you for this, uh, this presentation. Uh, my question is, like, uh, are you working in some protected area for your project? I mean, for all of uh, this project, and uh, if so, uh, how do you actually select the, the the people who are working with you? I mean, the people who participate on the all the workshop. And uh, my third question is: uh, maybe I didn't follow very well the presentation, but uh, have you been working also on some valuable plant like? like improving the yield of vanilla, cacao as well during your project? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer the first question, yes, there are, is an amazing network of protected areas just in the Sava region alone. There's over 100 protected areas in Madagascar and in the Sava there's at least 10. Uh, they're managed by uh, different organizations and with different schemes. So, for example, there's the Maro Jeji National Park, which is, um, you know, kind of an exclusive this, this uh, nature space set aside for, for only nature. There's other forests that are more uh, open to forestry and other forms of kind of, uh, you know, use and management. And in terms of, uh, yes, we do work in the in kind of the buffer zones of a lot of these protected areas. And, um, but in many of the cases, like Ambantaza, for example, it's not an officially protected area. It was once considered a, a forest reserve by the government, but um, there's really no formal protection. It's the local communities who want to protect it and make it um, what, it, you know, it is, um, in Madagascar, they have a system where the community can be the, 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 the people in charge of, of managing it as opposed to Madagascar National Parks, for example. The second question about how do we select communities, um, it largely comes from them. They, they come to us and they say, hey, we've got these ideas. Uh, we just need some technical financial assistance. Can you, can you help? Can we we want to get involved. And, um, you know, it, there is a bit of a selection process. I mean, for example, you know, I, I should preface by saying I, I've only been with the DLC, the Duke Lemur Center's project for the last four years. This is a project that's been going on for 10 years and even before that for 30 years in Madagascar generally. So I'm building on um, many, many, you know, giants before me. Um, so a lot of these communities were already engaged when I came in and I had the good fortune to, to meet them and, and start, you know, with the ground running. But when new communities come to us, we really do have to weigh the, the potential, you know, costs in terms of the resources we're going to have to allocate to this new project uh, against the benefits. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very hard pressed to say no in a lot of these cases. Um, I know that we're at max capacity, but when I can see that, um, you know, it's not all us, it's not just us trying to push this project and we're going to have to put all our resources. 
I see that the community, they come to us and they say, look, this is our land that we want to set aside to this project. Or here, you know, we have this perfect area where we can make fish ponds. Then, and, and they have this, uh, they often have uh, farming associations or um, they actually have a system like within the schools where the teachers and the parents work together. And, and those associations will, will, you know, take the role of, for example, the labor when we can provide the materials. So there has to be some, some real collaboration. And that's again goes down to the, uh, those written agreements where we say, okay, this is what we can provide. This is what you're willing to provide. We can move forward from here. Uh, I wish we could take on more, and hopefully in the future we will be able to. Actually, in the proposal that we're writing, we're, we're proposing 20 new communities all around these protected areas. So we'll, we'll see, fingers crossed. And then your last question was about um, improving the production of some of these key crops like vanilla, cacao. Um, you know, we're still so early on that I can't say for, for, for sure, yes, our method is improving the yield compared to other methods like, for example, if it was a monoculture. But again, based on like, you know, the evidence that we see in the literature and recent research that's been done in the region, we know that there's um, multiple ways of coming upon the same yield when it comes to vanilla. You know, it's not um, this um, negative relationship between uh, biodiversity and uh, yield that we see in a lot of other settings, like with coffee, for example. Uh, actually, it seems to be uh, independent of, you know, the yield seems to be independent of biodiversity, meaning um, that, you know, increasing the intensification would not necessarily come at the expense of biodiversity. However, we are working with uh, local trainers who have had um, the, the training themselves to say, you know, these, these are the traditional techniques that people have used, and, you know, this is the yield that we can get. And here are the new methods that have been designed. For example, there's a French organization called CIRAD that has done a lot of amazing research on best practices in vanilla, for example. And they're able to show, okay, you know, this is the proper spacing, two and a half meters. This is the proper amount of shade. These are the best shade trees. And, you know, we're adapting from there because, again, we want to promote more biodiversity and crop diversification. So, yeah, we're still in an early stage to say how well this is maybe improving. But when it comes to, for example, the market vegetable gardening, we uh, overwhelmingly see improvements in results. We're still, it's, it's difficult to measure yield, for example, on things like, you know, the greens and the beans that they're growing because it's, 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 it's still kind of a novel idea because, you know, vanilla, that's, that's the main one we want to measure. But uh, we're, we're trying to work on that as well so that we can really measure and say this is the improvement compared to past techniques. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question because you really emphasize that you're um, bringing trees or planting trees in a barren landscape and bringing the first shade there. And so um, then later on you said that the well, long-term goal is the self-recruitment of the trees. So in what broad time frame would you imagine that would be possible? Thank you. Yeah, the, the time frame, you know, it's daunting for me, <laughs> um, especially even just talking about cash crops, you know, for example, the cloves, you know, cacao, those will probably produce after about five years. They'll start to produce. For cloves, it's not until 10 years that they'll really produce uh, uh, a sizable yield. So that's the time frame in terms of, um, in terms of those cash crops. But when it comes to forest trees, I mean, I've been impressed to see the, the rapid growth in, in some of them, but we know that, for example, we, you know, rosewood is one of the trees that we are planting because it's, it's a legacy that they want to bring back is to have these precious woods, rosewood and ebony, and those are going to take a hundred years before they're big and mature, you know? So it's, uh, it's definitely a long-term vision. I've actually, you know, uh, it's inspiring to learn from uh, countries like in Germany the way that forestry has this forward thinking of, you know, these are planned 100 years, the, the tree plantings that we've done now, and, and, and 100 years we'll be able to harvest them. So I think that's a kind of thinking that maybe we need to try to implement in Madagascar as well. But it's also really difficult because we're facing these challenges today. You know, people and their, and their food insecurity challenges. It's hard to think 100 years from now, okay, we can wait 100 years to build our home. It's impossible. 
So we have to think about what are the fast producing trees. So for example, you know, eucalyptus, acacia, these introduced species that have been used around the tropics, you know, a lot of people are, are against them and I was for, for a very long time, but when used properly, these trees can produce a really valuable timber in just 10 or 15 years, acacia five years. And this is building material, this is fuel wood. So, you know, if, as long as it's not at the expense of native forests and native trees, I think it definitely still has a place so that we can have these kind of, um, kind of staggered successional phases for the forestry practices. Yes, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, very interesting because I, uh, I've seen already many attempts and many projects of uh, trying to uh, build agroforestry schemes um, or enrich biodiversity and really not all of them were successful. So um, quite an interesting and impressive example of that. Um, my question goes also towards the longevity of the project, but rather from another perspective. First, I was wondering, you were mentioning land titles and we know that they can play quite a crucial role in the long term. Uh, whether these land titles are legal or if people or a community has a legal land title. Uh, so um, maybe a bit of your perspective on that. Then you also mentioned the pressure from, uh, from other communities outside of going into areas and deforesting. I imagine this is not going to decrease in the next couple of years. So um, yeah, which then of course is, leads me to the question how well, will the, these communities be able to protect themselves from these people or from, from foreigners to protect these areas? If it's just a small, very simple community, I might assume it, these resources are rather limited. And then the last point would be, yeah, um, linked a bit to funds, uh, which I guess um, many of them, of them are smallholder farmers and then once the project runs out, I ask myself also how self-sustainable it is um, because, I mean, agroforestry, uh, I think, provides certainly a good share of income or at least some income, but certainly not 100% of the income of all these people in a community. So if you could address this a bit, thank you. Great. I have to write it down so I make sure I touch on all those. Uh, so in terms of land rights, how much time do I have? I'd love to talk, uh, give an entire presentation just on that topic. It's so fundamental and yet very rarely discussed because, um, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to put myself in the farmer's uh, position and think, you know, if, if their land, if their claim to the land is tenuous in terms of, you know, next year or several years from now, someone might come and contest their claim to the land, where the government might come and take their land, or you know, even a neighbor or a family member might say, "Hey, you know, this this is actually our land. You've been here illegally." What is the incentive for them to invest in a long-term strategy like agroforestry? Why would they plant the trees now that in five years may now belong to someone else? Um, so, absolutely, you're 100% right. And it's not that we try to exclude the people that don't have the the legal land rights because actually getting those land claims is almost impossible for most of these farmers. Um, the paperwork is extensive. Many of the farmers are unfortunately illiterate. The costs associated with bringing the, um, the, you know, the, the offices, the administrative offices that are in charge of those land titlings, the costs are, are uh, simply beyond what the average farmer can, can uh, support. And so recognizing the importance and the cultural significance of their traditional land inheritance systems is fundamental. So what we try to do, and what we're really trying to move forward with as, as we build on this project, is to bring the community members together on the landscape and, and say, okay, you know, hey, you haven't uh, gone and got your deed, you haven't gone and put down those, you know, mapping your, your actual, what is, what is your land, but, you all recognize each other's lands. And maybe there's some con con uh, contesting of boundaries, you know, this is this stream in your land or my land. But in general, people respect each other's 
land because it's it's a legacy. The, the system of land inheritance is typically from their parents. You know, their parents, they had 10 hectares and then they had five children and so they divide, you know, each child gets two hectares. It's not that simple, of course, but... Um, and, and this is a community that they're tight knit, they're extended family, and they can say, you know, hey, I remember since your grandfather was here, this was your land. And so they really respect that. So if we can bring people together and we can map it with them, we don't necessarily need to have the, um, you know, the office of land tenuring to come out and do it. Um, I think that's a, a step in the right direction. Uh, although I do really want to support more of the farmers to be able to get the official land rights because especially once they've restored it, you know, they, they really are worried that the government come, might come take their land or, you know, this is not necessarily something that happens, but they're worried about it because, again, why would I invest in such a long-term effort? It also has, you know, thinking about the impacts of cyclones. Uh, when, when you saw how steep some of these slopes are, if there's a cyclone that's going to come and wash out and erode my hill and all my trees are going to, you know, collapse into the valley, why would I go and invest so much in something that's not going to produce for 10 years? So it's definitely a big challenge, and I appreciate that you brought it up. I don't have a, a clear-cut answer, but I do feel like respecting traditional local land rights is our first step. Um, in terms of the... Um, kind of people from outside the community coming in and um, over-harvesting, manipulating local systems. You know, there's a lot of bribery that's, that's done as well. It's not only logging, but also gold mining and things like that. Um, you're right that it's not something that's going to change immediately. But again, by uh, working with the communities and building this solidarity, creating these associations, uh, they are now in a better position to go to the local authorities like the... Um, the Ministry of the Environment and say, hey, you know, look, we, uh, it's not just me that I say, oh, it's my land that they're logging. It's us as an association. It's us as a community that they can bring that force and that power to the local authorities. And that's much stronger than one person alone. And then, you know, we do try to um, back them as well and say, look, we've been working with this community for uh, many years now. We know that this is what they're trying to do and these people from outside are, you know, they're coming from really far off and they, it's, it's easy to see when they come in with these big operations. So by going to the Ministry of the Environment and, and all their local branches together as a unit, they have a lot more power. So I, I am hopeful that, you know, as we progress and they finalize their, um, their um, uh, formalization of, of their you know, community-led protected area, they'll be able to use that power. So, for example, there are, in, there are kind of like um, decentralized systems in place. They've got all these different forms of committees that get formal recognition from the government branches, but without that, they just don't have the power. So if they can create these committees and uh, those committees are formally recognized and they can bring the, they know what is the procedure we're supposed to follow, the paperwork we're supposed to fill out, and again, the Duke Lemur Center can help them with the paperwork and, you know, the transportation, because even even just bringing the authorities to the site, you know, you have to pay <laughs> to get them to come out and, and, and do this justice. So um, helping them out to overcome those barriers is, is something we're looking forward to doing. And uh, long-term sustainability and self-sufficient uh, funding of this project. You're right, it's not 100% of their income for 100% of households that are depending on agroforestry. But actually, a lot of the research that, that we're conducting, as well as from the Diversity Term Project, showed that really the, the number one form of income that folks have is vanilla, in many of these cases, or cloves, depending on where, where we're talking. Um, you know, they may be able to sell some of their greens and tomatoes and pineapples, but it's really not their main income. For the majority of people, their main income comes from selling these cash crops. Um, again, that's not everyone, but actually in some of these villages, it's 95% of people are, they consider themselves their main income generating activity is vanilla farming. So, again, that's risky, and we want to diversify, but um, for example, with the animal husbandry, like the aquaculture, uh, chicken husbandry, uh, that is an alternative, or not only alternative, but supplemental form of income. Um, and then creating these uh, village savings and loans associations or these community-based microfinance 
you know, they can diversify their income generating opportunities. Like for example, uh, people, we've heard all sorts of really great entrepreneurial ideas. Like they want to get into soap production and using organic materials to make soap because they see that the chemicals are uh, adversely affecting their water. Um, we've had uh, women's groups come and say they want to create a sewing association to supplement their income. Um, they want to do um, value-added products like making chips from their bananas or making jams from their fruits, uh, drying the fruit so it'll last longer. So all those kinds of um, kind of supplements to their income can help to uh, decrease the reliance on just the agroforestry. But again, the, the goal is for it to be more self-sustaining so that, you know, when I leave, it'll all continue. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your inspiring talk. I like to focus a little bit on education. I wonder in which ways are uh, the conducted community projects linked to teaching and learning in schools, given the uh, curricula, the current curricula. Uh, I, can't uh, I can imagine uh, that the project can be an enrichment to build an inspiring teaching and learning environment. Uh, can you eventually elaborate more on the best practices here? And um, can you also tell us a little bit more on your efforts to link the huge action-oriented community projects to school learning? Thanks. Thank you for that question. And we'll definitely be talking more about that in our meeting tomorrow. But I would love to be able to share a little bit now. So um, we have a few different arms to our education program. Some are very lemur-centric because you know, lemur hunting and keeping lemurs as pets is still a big problem that threatens um, these endangered species. So we have what we call the lemur awareness campaign where Evrard Beneswavana that you saw in the presentation, he has this goal to reach every single school in the Sava region, which is ambitious, but I support him. Um, and he's going school to school with um, a variety of different uh, media that he can use to teach about the value of lemurs. Um, so, for example, posters and um, um, coloring books that are uh, very focused on the local biota to emphasize not only, you know, that, oh, lemurs are endangered and they're endemic and we should protect them, but also what are the functions they provide for people? Like I said, they, they are the farmers growing these trees uh, and, and people know that and appreciate that. So that's, that's one area where he's going school to school and we're actually still in the, in the process of developing an evaluation instrument to determine how effective it is. But just to give you some examples, um, you know, we, we revisit these villages often and the schools and the children, even the year after they've graduated, they can still answer the, um, you know, tell us, you know, how many lemur species are there in Madagascar? Why are they important? But more importantly than you know, just acquiring knowledge, they, became, they become spokespersons for the environment themselves. I mean, some of the children have even uh, led um, kind of uh, education campaigns in their villages themselves. They go back to their homes and they tell their parents, hey, this is what we learned in school. We don't, we don't want to have lemur, in, you know, keep the lemur as a pet anymore, or we, we don't want to you know, hunt lemurs. So, you know, we, we still haven't had, uh, you know, numbers to put to that to say, okay, you know, 50% of the children then agree that they will continue to protect the forest. We're, we're not there yet, but we do see it as, as being effective. To answer your question more broadly, though, how can this be uh, integrated into the curriculum? One project that, they, that the Duke Lemur Center had before I started, and I really want to um, expand on, is um, teaching teachers about how to incorporate environmental principles into their uh, everyday curriculum. So, you know, the educational infrastructure in Madagascar uh, could be improved, let's say, and, you know, you'll have one teacher with 100 kids in their classroom and they are, have a mandate that we've got to teach them the math and the French and, the, uh, and, and reading and writing and they don't have time in their schedule or resources to be able to teach about environment. So what our training program did was uh, try to show how they can integrate environmental principles into the existing curriculum, for example. When they're using, you know, word problems in math, they can use examples from the environment, like, you know, if there were 100 trees, you know, 10 years ago, and they cut 10 trees per year, how many are going to be left? Something like that. Um, or even about farming, you know, if you, if you planted, uh, you know, 15 kilos of rice and you yielded 100 kilos, or you, you produced 100 kilos, what was the yield? Things like that. So that's a project that we really want to expand uh, over 
2,000 teachers were trained in that program. And again, we want to do more evaluations, but we want to expand to, to more communities. And then I think just lastly, I'll say that, for example, with some of these tree nurseries that we've established, uh, it's in partnership with the parent-teacher associations. So the kids, you know, it's right outside the school. The kids can come out every day and they help out in the nursery, you know, watering the tree seedlings. They plant every year around the schoolyard. And, you know, they, they've seen in the time since they started school until they're finished, some of these trees are now taller than they are. So, you know, they... That's actually how Everard says he was motivated. His teacher had them plant mango trees in their schoolyard, and he came back 10 years later, and there they were producing fruit, and he said, I can do that too. So, again, it's end of one, but uh, it's those kind of stories that really inspire me to keep going with the environmental education. Uh, yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, if I got that right, you're currently experimenting with several different uh, types of trees but it comes down to mainly like five or six uh, mm -hmm. types that you're using so um, yeah how, how high would you estimate the value of the forests that now grow as a potential habitat for lemurs or other endangered species Thank you. Yeah, uh, when you compare to these old growth forests, these are depauperate landscapes. Um, and a lot of the trees that do the best in these landscapes are not actually lemur food trees because those lemur food trees are kind of the climax community trees. Um, so what I've, I'm trying, you know, I, I have a background as, as uh, Dirk mentioned in, in ecology. I'm trying to think about how we can implement principles of natural su succession to create this baseline where those, these pioneer tree species can provide the shade under which we can now plant those more climax and lemur uh, food tree species. One of the challenges that we face is just getting enough seeds. Uh, you know, we've got to go out to the forest, we've got to find the, the seeds that have fallen under the mother trees that are not rotten. Um, in one project, in a collaboration with another PhD candidate at Duke, she's actually collecting the seeds from the lemur feces and growing them in the nurseries to show that the seeds that have been passed by lemurs actually germinate and grow better than those that just fall under the mother tree. And again, we can think about ecological principles in that regard, you know, the seed shadow and seed rain. And, you know, in some of these settings, you might have noticed there, there are still nuclei of, of natural forest. And without the lemurs and other you know, birds to disperse the seeds, it's going to be hard for them to, to get much further than just falling underneath the mother tree. So if we can collect those and, and take those to the nursery, and this year we're actually doing a lot more of that. I mean, you know, it, it, in my first few years in the project, it was just such a, a labor of love to try to find any tree seeds. Uh, and now we've got this community of people who are really uh, actively going out to forests, collecting the trees. I mean, uh, just in the last few months, we acquired almost 100 kilos of, um, uh, well, I won't name all the species, but rosewood was one of them. And rosewood's not a great example because it's not a lemur food tree. But again, it's, a, it's a, an indicator of that climax community. And, um, you know, it, it really is going to take a lot of time. I think maybe after five years, we'll have enough shade uh, in, in these early with, from these early pioneer species to be able to now plant uh, later stage trees. But again, just, just acquiring enough seed stock can be a challenge. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned that a lot of the like, restoration projects and a lot of the just projects that are happening are done by hand. Are there plans to like introduce mechanization, or is it even possible to introduce mechanization? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there have been efforts um, in other countries, but also in Madagascar. To you know, we, we showed those seed balls or seed bombs. Um, some people are just flying over in helicopters, distributing you know hundreds of thousands of those seed balls, or even using drones. And you know, I, I got excited when I first heard about it, but then when I see how uh, low the probability of success is with some of these. If we were just dumping them everywhere, I can't imagine that the success would be very high. You know, they, when they just land on the, on the soil surface, they're now still exposed to that hot sun. Um, they're, they're, they're drying out, and, the, and, and 
I, I just can't imagine that, or even also uh, rat predation. I, I wanted to mention that as well. Uh, predation by rats is a big problem for the seeds as well as the seedlings. So I, I really feel like it requires, uh, also, you know, you would just end up, by chance, you're going to have these clusters where, you know, 10 or 15 seed balls have now fallen in this small area. We're trying to very specifically space them out two by two, by two meters to have a planting density of a thousand seedlings per hectare, things like that. So I'm, I'm a little bit less excited about, you know, the, the mass spreading of the seeds by drones or helicopters. Um, and also it would just make it so hard to evaluate, right? Like how many do we really think landed successfully in such a way and how do we go back and count them? Um, I, I wish we could have a more effective and, and, and a method like that, but right now I'm not convinced. And sorry, right next to you, Barbara, I had seen the question. Yeah. Yes, thank you for this. Uh, you just mentioned within your uh, presentation, um, there was a, um, individual involvement in tree planting, right? I just a bit curious about if the government involved in this kind of um, recognition, if after he planted history or how the government help him or promote the others communities to see as him like oh he, he did a great job and then you need to follow or something like that mm -hmm. so just wonder in the, the role of the government and my second question is what is the key challenge for your projects that you are implementing uh, since the uh, farmers they are looking what are they going to eat today tomorrow but your project is like a long term long goal so the key challenge would be what and how do you um, solve these kind of challenges? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. To respond, uh, let me just go. So the um, role of government for sure is uh, an important one. If there aren't policies in place to promote these kinds of uh, restoration efforts, it, it really just comes down to individuals and communities and it may not scale. So I, I think that Madagascar has had a long uh, history of positive government influence in the environmental regulation. So going back as far as I've been um, working in Madagascar to 2007 and, and before, uh, the previous president was uh, very pro-conservation. He participated in the Durban challenge to increase the amount of protected areas threefold, and, and they did it. Uh, the current president uh, signed on to the bond challenge so that the um, you know, restoration efforts in Madagascar were government mandated. Um, all the Ministry of Environment uh, staff that I've met are fully dedicated to not only restoration but also protecting uh, the forest. But it, it really does come down to the financial mechanisms to get it done. Um, and unfortunately, Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world, as I think many of you know. And without significant um, external funding, a lot of these projects just can't even get off the ground. But um, there has been quite a bit of international funding from the World Bank and FAO and, and a lot of uh, other organizations that have made a lot of this work possible. And at the same time, there have been a couple of interesting publications to show that despite you know, tens of millions of dollars of uh, external conservation investment, we're still facing forest loss and, and endangered species. So, you know, um, it's, it's not perfect, and uh, we'd love to see more policy in place that could um, subsidize a lot of these activities, for example. I was having some really great uh, conversations earlier where, you know, if you think about uh, other countries, subsidies is a, is a big reason why people will make a shift, a farmer might make a shift from a monoculture to a polyculture, because there's a government policy in place that incentivizes it. So if we had more of that, I think, uh, we could make a bigger difference, but uh, I think that may also be a long-term vision or goal that you know we're not going to see very soon. In terms of, um, like we said, these are long-term investments in restoration, but we still need to meet the, meet these short-term needs of, you know, what are we going to eat today? Uh, I think that's where the agroforestry and syntropic farming, where we're including annual crops within the same space as those tree crops, especially during those first five years until the cash crops start to produce. You know, we, we often think that it has to be one or the other, but it can very easily be both depending on how you're managing the land and the people's goals. So I 
think I'm getting a, the hook, but yeah. I would love to talk to you more I'm about it afterwards. Up. James gave us such a good talk and also such an enriching, enriching discussion. But now I think we are also approaching the end. So I would like to thank the audience to attend tonight. I think for all the questions, I would like to invite you to come here next week. We will have another great talk. It will be most interesting, but for today, I do thank James, I thank you, Mary, also for coming and giving us this wonderful talk, sharing your ideas and, and discussing with us. And yeah, thank you for coming over. My pleasure.